So uh, decolonizing the mind, uh, if we're talking about 12 practices, you know, this is actually more you know, like running and dancing and singing, sleep, laughter and humor, collectivism, fasting, and all the way down to being outside. Um, what we know about movement is that, you know, we evolved to run, right? We should be moving all the time. It improves our physical fitness and our brain's working memory and processing speed. I just had a conversation with um, folks. I did a presentation today with the uh, National Communication Association in the United States, and they had a lot of uh, neuroscience people on there who were talking about the improved uh, uh, function of the executive part of the brain, you know, and how you know it helps us delay gratification, avoid distraction, and improve cognitive flexibility. Well, guess what? Mindfulness does the same thing. And running supercharges it in the same way. Think about it. BDNF running increases the miracle growth for the brain. And the last, um, you know, it, we we get stronger uh, neural connections, neurons that are wiring, firing together, wired together, and you know, we're 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 able to you know continue to do this. And our dendritic spines for running increase because it's a rich exercise. The last bullet point is that this is that we know that you know from the more current research that regular endurance exercise, right? Whether it's walking fast for a long way like the Buddha did or running like this guy's running here or like some of you who do endurance exercise like swimming or riding a bike or getting your heart rate up for longer periods of time. What it does is it increases skeletal muscle curirinine that protects us from depression. And it goes through this whole process of, of, of raising and increasing cat and, and, and addressing the uh, KYN, which is the neurotoxic curinine that causes the depression to the production of curinetic acid, right? So now we know a little bit about why, you know, um, um, running is so powerful. It's such a powerful tool, right? And you couple that together with all these other things I talked about, um, they, which is why, of course, I said earlier that depression <laughs> is a novel disease because our ancestors are doing all the things I talked about. You know, they weren't sitting around or they weren't worrying about things, right? They were constantly in movement and sleeping well and, and, and so on. Uh, we also know that um, something else I mentioned before about movement, dancing and singing is what I part, partly I call movement, right? Oh, you know, so 2018, this study was done that showed that the rise in uh, endocannabinoids in the brain of this particular uh, um, uh, sample of, of uh, postmenopausal uh, women enhance their mood, right? This has been replicated since, but we know that it, it you know, um, um, dancing improves the mood and cycling, it does the same thing as it raises different kinds of endocannabinoids. The, the, the biggest lift that people get is from singing in a particular study, raising these endocannabinoids in the brain. We don't live like our ancestors who walked everywhere they went and they sang songs wherever they went and they were dancing every evening or in the afternoon or they were dancing for all kinds of things. And um, what happens when they're dancing and doing the ceremonial dancing, you see these, uh, I believe these are Yurok people from Northern California. I was a professor out there at Humboldt State University. So I, I knew a lot of Yurok um, elders and, and uh, spiritual leaders and students and that sort of thing. So I got to know a little bit about you know, their dances um, and, and their culture. And I was fortunate to be in, in their part of the, the, the world in their territory. But we know now from uh, this research is that those um, endocannabinoids that, that raise because we're dancing and we're laughing and smiling and we're singing, um, they also um, uh, are they're, 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 you know, signaling messengers and they improve our mood, reduce our stress and anxiety, enhance our memory, they protect our brain, you know, again, this is another protection against, you know, the Alzheimer's disease of the, the Western uh, industrialized society, and they reduce pain, right? We've got our own built-in endocannabinoid systems that, you know, um, um, express when we get involved in these kinds of things. We know that the power of dance is that it improves our memory, our attention, focus. So if you were dancing mindfully, like these, um, um, Mandan um, people are from my reservation long ago doing a buffalo dance and 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 they have to remember the song they have to remember the movements of the buffalo and they have to turn their attention and focus on being a buffalo so when they when they mimic the power of the buffalo of the bison of the danaha as we say in my language you know it raises their levels of endocannabinoids 
along with their levels of testosterone, along with their levels of dopamine, you know, the reward chemical. And also as they dance together, you know, they're, they're sort of all in the same society, it raises their levels of oxytocin, the bonding and love chemical. Now think about that. You can't find that in a pill anywhere. You can't find that protection anywhere. So they're mindfully doing these cultural dances, right? We know that in other research that ballroom dancing, this particular program uh, with older people who are having mild cognitive um, issues, after 10 months of ballroom dancing, improve their thinking memory, right? Why do we have Alzheimer's and dementias happening at such a high level? Why do we have so much anxiety and depression, right? Yeah, we have, we have uh, I mean, um, depression, I should say. Yeah, we have colonization. Yes, we have, you know, racist uh, things happening. Yes, we have, you know, all these different kinds of trauma. But the way in which indigenous people and all traditional peoples did at one time to combat and build resilience against those kinds of things are the things I'm talking about. Movement, dancing, singing. And we know that dance is, you know, a really big part of our human experience, been with us for thousands of years. And it's really part of our DNA, you know, this, which is why that um, I was reading some interesting research that the, the, the baby begins to bounce at a time to a music before they begin to talk. When you see a little baby and you hear a drum or you hear a certain kind of music and the baby starts to bounce, it's part of the DNA that we've evolved with, right? I mean, if you hear a, a, a really song that you like, you know, you wanna move your head, move your body a bit, right? But you don't wanna do it because that's not cool in society, you know? Most people don't do that kind of thing. They'll do it at a concert or whatever, but no one's gonna do it on the street because they say, look at this person, they're high on some kind of drug or something, right? Um, but that's the, that's the kind of thing. And, and we do it on a regular basis, you know, um, uh, with one another, right? And we think and, and interact with one another and think about it being synchronized. If you've ever seen bird murmurations where you've got tens of thousands of birds flying in the same pattern back and forth in the skies, humans are like the same thing. We, we, um, we move you know, um, in, in a very, very um, similar pattern. And we evolved to do that in a synchronized unison, just like birds murmurations are like fish doing schooling, laughter, um, really important, right? Really important because it's down to, again, like it's like dancing. It's down to DNA differences, right? We know that people with the short alleles, this particular uh, genetic variant uh, called the serotonin transporter gene, 5-HTT-LPR gene that have that are people that have what I call the funny bone gene. They're going to smile more. They're going to laugh more. They're going to enjoy humor more. They're going to, um, you know, think about pranks. They're going to tease more. Um, you know, they're, they're going to flourish where there's a lot of smiles and joking and funny stories and, and you know, uh, those kinds of things. But when, they're, when they come to a society where it's all serious, don't smile, that's inappropriate, right? That's a negative environment. And it, it really dampens down this particular um, gene. Um, and, and what happens is that they um, suffer, you know, anxiety disorders. So we know that, you know, this exists a lot in collectivist cultures, like indigenous people around the world. More people in those cultures across this particular cross-national sample of 29 nations, uh, a study that was done, uh, more people have the funny bone gene, right? It's, it's critical, right? Um, what does is, what is humor and laughter do? Well, it increases BDNF. There's BDNF again. Improves memory and learning. It lowers cortisol, relaxes blood vessels, improves our immune response releases um, um, endorphins and actually raises endocannabinoids. Think about that, right? These are all things that are related to, again, decolonizing the mind. Sleep, very important. Um, you know, it's really important to know that we all have our uh, circadian rhythm clock when it breaks down and we're not rising with the sun and going to bed with the, uh, 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 you know, the night. Um, we have all these, we're at risk for all these different diseases. Our brain actually shrinks, right? The brain has its own cleaning system that cleans out all the molecular junk in the brain, including um, amyloid proteins and tau uh, proteins that are in the brain that are hallmarks of uh, Alzheimer's disease, which we all have. You know, uh, It's not just old folks that have those. When you don't get sleep, it starts to build up in your brain. Um, 
critical for kids. Uh, it's, it's when hormone growth hormones and infection uh, fighting proteins are released. It affects our memory, right? Uh, I mentioned uh, mild bioenergetic stress already, but let me just say this, that being in these situations, like our ancestors were when, you, when they challenged themselves and, into sitting in a really hot sauna or a sweat lodge, and often, you know, uh, there's, even a, there's even research that shows that sitting in a hot um, sauna five to seven times a week um, for 20 minutes raises the level, the, the, the number of heat shock proteins in the cells. And heat shock proteins um, are an indicator of healthy um, bodies and minds, long, longevity, disease protection, healthy skeletal muscles and also reduction in um, stress and anxiety and depression and the raising of endocannabinoids and BDNF, this stuff is all happening in these hot and cold environments. In the cold environment, when you go on cold water swims or you take cold showers every morning, they're called cold shock proteins doing essentially the same thing. Fasting is the same. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on that because it's, um, you know, I don't wanna to take too much time here. Um, um, but just to let you know that, you know, um, we evolved to fast and you know it's one of the things that helps raise our level of of um of uh, consciousness and helps you know calm down the anxiety um, for a lot of people of course you know has to be supervised and has to be at the right time if you remember the story about the buddha the buddha went too far you know he fasted he was fasting and he was pretty soon almost starving to death and he had to be fed by the village girl you know some rice and rice milk and rice pudding or whatever he, he was given to eat so he had to learn the middle way, right? So oh, can't do that. Um, but we also know that, you know, when we fast, we have all these benefits, right? Uh, improved blood pressure, loss of abdominal fat, better uh, glucose regulation, uh, protection of the brain and the neurons against all these different Alzheimer's diseases and Parkinson's and Huntington's. And the thing about it is that I said the last bullet point, when we challenge ourselves, not just sitting on a cushion, you know, for at a retreat, you know, for that many hours. That's one way, you know, that our body responds. Uh, but going without food, for instance, or running long distances without food, which I do sometimes, imposes a challenge to our cells, and our cells respond. They, you know, get stronger to cope with stress and resist disease. Right? Uh, I'm I'm telling you this because some of these things that that indigenous people did, as I started my talk out with. They were part of celebrations and part of uh, rituals that, you know, in order to become a warrior, in order to become a, a traditional healer, in order to become a better person, a better mom or a better dad or a better son or daughter or, you know, um, you know a helper in the village, a lot of times people would be um, encouraged to fast, right? Because they would get insights, right? They, you know, and they would, they would, um, develop resistance you know, to disease and their cells would be challenged. Um, being outside, very important. Um, I won't say too much about that other than, you know, um, it's, 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 we're seeing a lot more happening with land-based education, a lot more with, um, the importance of, of being outside. And some of you may have heard of forest bathing, um, but it's all this, right now we're dealing with what, you know, this uh, um, Richard Loeb calls, um, 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 nature uh, deficit disorder and the epidemic of inactivity, right? Why it's, again, why it's so important. 